give you salvation just to possess it. You and I are to become the Christians God saved us to become. and turn with me into the Psalms to Psalm 55 and verse 1. Psalm 55 and verse 1. I speak to you for just a little while on the praying home. And I, I want to ask this question as we begin. Do you have a home? Not a house, but a home. A house is a, a place. A home involves people. Do you have a Christian home? Do I have a Christian home? Just because we're Christians does not necessarily mean we have a Christian home. Is Christ the head of your home? Do we recognize his ruling presence in our homes? There are many people who have grown up with Christian parents but did not grow up in a Christian home. And then third question, do we have praying homes? Well, if we have Christian homes, truly Christian homes, we have praying homes. But there are many Christians who don't have a Christian home and there are many Christians who don't have a praying home. Let's look at this, please, just for a moment. In Psalm 55 and verse 1, the Bible says, Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not thyself from my supplication. Verse 17 of the same Psalm, Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud. And he shall hear my voice. Then turn with me, please, to the New Testament, to the book of 1 Thessalonians. And one of the shortest verses in the Bible, but packed with God's power and blessing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17. As Paul is concluding this letter, he pens, by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, he writes... And what we have is verse 17, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing. Most of you know that I did not grow up in a Christian home. I had no idea about a Christian home. When I became a Christian, I learned there was such a thing as not just being a Christian, but living in a Christian home and establishing a Christian home. I remember very well some of the homes I was privileged to go into and I recognized immediately from the way those people lived and what they said, how they approached mealtime, how they closed the end of the day with families, how they began the day in the morning, even some of the things they had placed on the walls of their homes made them different from other places where I'd been with families inside of a house. I learned later that those were Christian homes. Not because of what they had taken out of the home. You didn't expect to find alcohol as a beverage. You didn't expect to find profanity. You didn't expect to find dirty magazines of any kind with nude pictures or any of that kind of thing. But you could remove everything imaginable that you might deem bad from a home and still not have a Christian home. They had Christian homes by what they had put into the home and into the lives of those they loved, how they treated one another, how they cared for each person living in that home. I said to my wife when we were courting and ready to get married, I have one goal for my married life, one At the time, I did not know God wanted me to be a preacher. But I'd yielded my life to Christ. I said as a young man, I want the Lord to have full control and do whatever he wishes to do with me. And I want to serve him all of my life. And I said to Evelyn, my one goal for our marriage is to have a Christian home. And I need help. I didn't grow up in one. She did. She has a devout Christian mother who loves the Lord. Exemplary in her Christian behavior. She saw all of that. 
After the death of her father, she was greatly influenced by grandparents, especially one granddaddy who was such a uh, devoted Christian man. Matter of fact, his name was William. They called him Bill. They didn't just call him Bill. They, they called him Good Bill. He got the identity as Good Bill because he served God in the church and gave an exemplary example of a Christian life. Good Bill. Good Bill Rogers. God bless him. And what a precious friend he became to me. And I said to her, I need your help. If we're going to have a Christian home, I need your help. She was the one who came up with the idea that we read the Bible to our children and read through it. She was the one who had the idea that we get up and get ready every morning about our routine and have everything prepared to walk out the door in a disciplined way 30 minutes before we had to leave so we could take that 30 minutes with our children and read the Word of God in prayer. Have prayer with them. 1,189 chapters in the Bible. We read a chapter a day. Some days were a very long chapter. We took two days and some with very short chapters. We read a number of chapters in a day. But we went through the Bible many times with our two sons. Every word, every verse, that was her idea. God bless her for it. She's the one who taught me to pray about things. Let's pray about it. I remember at one difficult time in life, we needed tires on our car. And she said, let's pray. I went down to a place and found a place that uh, sold used tires. I could get uh, used tires for $40, $10 a piece. That's all I thought I could afford and didn't have the money to afford that. She said, let's pray and ask God. And you know, believe it or not, they came in the mail to our house, two $20 bills in an envelope with a note. You use this any way you need to use it. That was an answer to prayer. She's the one who said, let's pray for it. I could tell stranger stories than that about how she prayed for things and asked specific amounts. I mean, to the penny. And it came in just that way. Believe in God. I believe when I said I need your help to have a Christian home, she understood that I needed help and she was going to help me. Even Ben Franklin wrote about marriage. He said, a marriage should be like the two pieces of scissors put together. If you have scissors and you're trying to cut with just one side of it, you'll never get it done. It takes both of them to operate. And he said, that's the way a marriage ought to be. Think of that, Ben Franklin. And uh, I have that in a written form, quote from him, where the scissors work together. And I said to her, let's work together and have a Christian home. And we failed in many ways. I failed in many ways overreacting to things, but I believe that if our children were to testify... They would testify as they look back upon their lives growing up in our home that they grew up in a Christian home. Maybe not the best Christian home, but they grew up in a Christian home. And you cannot have a Christian home without having a praying home. I was reading some things in preparation for this little exhortation. and Again, I reviewed the life of Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was born to sort of an itinerant evangelist and his wife, James Hudson Taylor, and they prayed for a lost world. They could not go to the regions beyond like they knew someone needed to go. And they asked God to give them a son. And that that son would surrender his life to serve God in places where they would never see him again. They believed God for it in their Christian home. And when Hudson Taylor came along, they knew that was God's answer to their prayers. When Hudson Taylor surrendered his life to the Lord. His mother was miles away and she knew it had taken place. She said the Heavenly Father let her know that her prayers and her husband's prayers had been answered. You'd never have a Hudson Taylor. You'd never have anything to talk about in the China Inland Mission and the great work Hudson Taylor did winning souls to Christ if there hadn't been a praying home. A praying home. There was a devout young lady named Susanna I've stood by her grave many times in London, England, just across from one of the Wesley chapels, the main one where Wesley himself is buried. Everybody recognized when she was just a young girl that she was a devout Christian. She was the daughter of a dissenter, a preacher who would not line up with the church of his day and the church of England. Uh, he was called a dissenter. They were the, out, the scourge of, of society, but he was a true Bible-believing man. And she was a young lady with special gifts. She married a man named Wesley. 
And in 21 years of marriage, she gave birth to 19 children. Just over half of them lived. One of them's name was John. Another famous one you know is named Charles. When John was only six years old, only six years old, they had a terrible fire that destroyed the residence where the preacher, her husband, lived. And everybody escaped the flames except little John Wesley, six-year-old boy. He was upstairs in a room and nobody could get to him through the flames. And someone in the crowd got the idea that if they stood on shoulders, they could reach a window and retrieve him. And that they did, and they retrieved him, pulling him out of the flame. And when Susanna held that child in safety in her arms, she said, God has a special purpose for him. I know it, and I'm going to give even more attention to little John, because I know because of the way God spared his life, he has something special for him. That was a praying home. She spent an hour every week with each of her children just talking about spiritual things. She was so disciplined in her life, she spent an hour in the morning and in the evening just alone herself with God, praying and communing with the Lord. John Wesley, the great preacher and founder of Methodism, not what it is today, but what it once was, and the magnitude of it that circled the globe, said that he is a grown man preaching. And many times when he was preaching to fifteen or 20,000 people in the field, his mother was standing by his side. He said, one of the things that sustained me in ministry is thinking about, thinking about those Thursday evenings when I had my special hour with my mother. You wouldn't have a Wesley. You wouldn't have had all the Wesley revival accomplished. They said that England itself would have gone through the same kind of revolution that France went through if it had not been for the Wesley revival. But you'd never had him if you hadn't had a praying home. A praying home. I brought a little note along about what I consider to be our greatest president of recent times, Ronald Reagan. And I, I wrote this quote from Reagan. I want you to hear it. He talks about prayer. I've always believed that we were, each of us, put here for a reason. That there is a plan, somehow divine plan, for all of us. In an effort to embrace that plan, we are blessed with the special gift of prayer, the happiness and solace to be gained by talking to the Lord. That's prayer. It is our hope and our aspirations, our sorrows, and our deep remorse and renewed resolve, our thoughts and our joyful praise, and most especially, our love, all turn toward a loving God that we experience in our prayers. Many of us have been taught to pray by people we love. In my case, it was my mother who taught me to pray in our praying home. Now, the father was a drinker and a man you would not have wanted to use as an example, but the mother made the home a praying home. I want to give you these simple things. Would you write them down, please? A praying home provides the right spirit for a family. The right spirit. It's a spirit of God. It's the spirit of God. It's the spirit of prayer. It provides the right spirit for, for a home. Charles Spurgeon said the spirit of prayer is more important than the habit of prayer. I think he meant by that that instead of just habitually praying, and we need to habitually pray uh, with things that we know ought to have... Uh, the disciplined life and times to pray. But Spurgeon said we ought to stay in a spirit of prayer. And in a praying home, there is a spirit of prayer. And that brings a spirit of hopefulness, a spirit of faith, relying on God, believing God. He'll get us through this. In a real praying home, you don't find children who are always dragging around and remorseful and always complaining and griping about what they don't have because they live in a home where the family talks to God and the children are taught how to pray and how they can talk to God. The great thing about a home, any home, is to have the right spirit in that home. You can have beautiful furnishings, the nicest of houses to dwell in, plenty of money. You can have meals that people would desire to have anywhere in the world. 
You can provide vacation time. You can put the right clothes that a kid wants on his or her back. But if you don't have the right spirit in that home, you don't have the home God wants you to have. And a praying home provides that spirit. It's a spirit of faith. It's a spirit of decency. It's a spirit of the consciousness of Christ in that home. Mother is more guarded about what she says. Mother is more guarded about what they talk about in the family, what she says about other people and about herself because there's prayer in that home. It's a praying home. It provides the right spirit in the home. And another thing, it provides the right strength for that home. You don't find defeated families that have praying homes. You don't find them. Because they know that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ever ask or can think. And they don't run around defeated. They know they have the strength of the Lord. And by the way, you're going to face troubles. I said to our folks in, who work closest to me in the ministry here just recently, I said, we don't, we don't announce and know exactly when our families in this church are going to have trouble. When we get a phone call that some child has been taken to the hospital and they suspect something very serious. Uh, one of our men just with uh, cancer and uh, he's pressing on and he's standing strong because he has a praying home, a praying family. You see, that gives the strength to the matter that we need. Uh, you don't find families falling apart because they know they can rely upon the Lord for the strength that only God can give. Even when there's things that are irreversible, some things you can't get back and you need the strength to carry on when something tragic takes place and those kinds of things can come. You don't explain them all. I was talking about Wesley earlier. Wesley was married to a woman who became a drunkard. Think of that. One of the greatest preachers ever lived. His wife became a drunkard. She was a rebel and, excuse me, a devil of a woman. She finally left him. She never came back. What do you think got him through? Prayer. Where did he find the strength? He found it in the Lord. And when your home gets hit by, uh, uh, in, in metaphoric terms, a Mack truck, how do you carry on? You carry on in the strength of the Lord. God enables you. You're putting into the hearts of your children when you have a praying home the thing that will help them stand in the toughest trials of life. You're putting it in their hearts and mind, even when they're just little ones. Oh, beloved, we need, we need to have not just homes, beyond a house, a home, and not just say we're Christians, but a Christian home. And it can't be a Christian home without being a praying home. David said, evening and morning and at noon will I pray. For the Jew, they, they opened the new day at the close of the old day, the day they lived, when the sun went down the evening. That was the beginning of the day. They recognized the importance of bedtime, evening time. They recognized the importance of things calming down and coming to God. When God created the world, he said evening and morning, the first day, evening and morning, the second day, evening and morning, the third day. He's telling us something important there. Our lives and our families and our homes can be ruined by all this junk and nonsense that goes on at night when we're approaching bedtime. But in a praying home, there's calm, there's confidence. I spent more than a year of my life as a child wondering if this was going to be the night that my mother and father were going to leave one another. In a Christian home and a praying home, children need to go to bed with confidence. When I wake up in the morning, my parents will be here for me. In a praying home, a world of difference. And how they live the next day has to do with how they go to bed in the evening in a praying home. It was Evelyn who said, we're going to go to our children's bedroom every night and we're going to pray with them. We're going to kneel beside their bed. We're going to kiss them goodnight, tell them we love them and we love one another. And God's going to care for them through the night. And we did that every night of their lives while they lived as children in our home. Because she was helping me have a Christian home. And you may have a husband just like she had a husband that needs a lot of help, ladies. And if you want to have a praying home, a truly Christian home, 
You're going to have to come alongside him and help him do what God's put in his heart to do. When this is all over, our lives have been spent. We leave this world and meet God. We're going to talk about collectively what we did as an assembly of believers. But we're going to be greatly saddened we rushed through this world attending all the meetings of the church even attaching ourselves to the things going on in the church and neglected to have a praying home let's bow our heads in prayer may we Father, help us to act upon what we say we believe. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We all need the Lord. We need His salvation. We need His divine aid in living the Christian life. How many of your Christians, would you mind giving a testimony to that by raising your hand? I'm a Christian, you say. How many are married? You and your wife living together. Would you raise your hands? God bless you. How many of you have a house or a dwelling? Is it a home? Is it a Christian home? Is it filled with the spirit of Jesus? You can't have that without prayer. Is it strong in the Lord? You can't have that without prayer. How many men and women would say, these are tough times. Perhaps we're dealing with things we've never had to deal with before. and It might be a quarter of a century before things take some change in some, some of the issues in this country. Is your home strong enough to handle it? I know this, God is. Amen? Amen. God is. And I want him right where he belongs in my home. God is. How many men, husbands, wives would stand and say, I'm going to work harder. I'm going to work harder at this Christian home, at having a praying home. Don't be embarrassed by it. Would you just stand? Where, where, where we are, do it now, will you? All around. All around. How many of you women, your husband's standing? You stand with him now. You stand by his side. Just like I said to, I said to Evelyn, I need your help. I know we need a Christian home, and I need your help. And may God help us. There are people here who are without Jesus who ought to come and let us show you the way of salvation. There's some of you here that have been saved and want to obey the Lord in baptism. I want you to leave your place now, right now, would you please? Just wherever you are, leave your place now. You come. We're going to sing in just a moment. Search me, O God. Search me. And know my heart today. And he will search us. He'll reveal to us. Try me, O Savior. Know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. I'm going to ask you, dear ones who are standing, in a moment we begin to sing, come and take just a moment and tell the Lord something definite you need help with. It might be like Susanna Wesley. and Maybe you think, well, she was just too disciplined. Every child had his or her hour. She had her hour in the morning and the evening. Well, I'll say this. If we could produce another John Wesley, I'd say let's do it. Wouldn't you? So little discipline anyway. And may God help us. Father, may thy precious will be done. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. We're going to sing and invite people to stand in just a moment. But those of you who are standing so that no one's in your way. I want you, even now as we begin, just leave your place.
right now. Find a place here to pray and say, Lord, this is for me. This is for me. I want my home to stand the test. I want it to be stronger and stronger. May God help us. Let's all stand together and turn to hymn number 111. We'll sing it, 111. And we'll be quick about it. May God guide us. Search me, O God. Let's sing it, please. Search me, O God.